Welcome to Hobby Clubhouse with a review of the HGUC HiZac, bringing us way back to one of the earliest releases, specifically the 12th release of the high-grade Universal Sentry line. New releases are good and exciting, but the HG line now has well over 230 releases and chances are your next purchase may not necessarily be one of those new releases. The HiZac was recently reprinted, now with the blue Bandai badge and maybe this is something you're curious about buying. The kit was released all the way back in July 2000 for a price of 1,080 yen, and it comes in a box measuring 29 by 19 by 6 centimeters, so it's a bit on the thin side, but it's quite normal for a mass-produced grunt suit. The box art is illustrated by Shino Masanori, who has worked in F91, Double Zeta Gundam, and also Gundam Wing on top of lots and lots of other animation, so he's really no random artist. You can also see the older style of high-grade box layouts with the illustration offset to the right-hand side and a photo of the actual kit. Current boxes are taken up by one big illustration, and the featured MS is up front and center. There's also the MS's specs here, which they no longer do now. The side of the box has a front and a back shot of the Hizak, along with some in-universe history about why the Federation now uses a Zaku-type mobile suit. The other side has studio shots of the different parts of the kit and some writing on the highlights of this kit, and that's really all there is. Earlier HGs really didn't cram nearly as much information onto the boxes as they do now. Inside the box, we have the Hizak spread across three runners and a set of poly caps. And the sheet of foil stickers is just as Spartan, with a black sticker for the back of the mono eye, and then a pink sticker for the mono eye itself that you can position anywhere you like. Then there's just these two stickers here that color the notch at the front of the feet, and that's all there is. The instructions have some studio shots on the back to accompany the coloring guide. The rest of the color pages have detailed information on the Hizak, and notably, they have some design drawings for this interpretation of the mobile suit which they really don't do anymore with the newer high grades. The rest of the info covers things like the equipment and the notable parts of the mobile suit, and the backside is all in black and white and covers the entire assembly instructions. So here's the completed Hizak after about an hour of assembly. With how few stickers it has, it came up with almost all the colors done properly in plastic. Only small details like the tips on the fin of the backpack really need some painting, so if you want a Hizak on your shelf, this will look proper right out of the box. What's not so nice are some of the nasty seams on this kit, particularly this one going all the way along the head, splitting it cleanly in half. Not only is this snout going to be a nightmare to sand down, but the mono eye part on the inside is going to be a logistical pain in the butt to paint and juggle. Other seams include this one along the thigh, which is hidden as a panel line in the front, but on the back, it's left just bare. The shins have another seam running all the way down the middle, and it's very visible both front and back. Then there's the expected line along the spike armor, though this one is a bit more forgivable, and this is often just a reality of most Zaku-type mobile suits. Then, the forearms are also split right down the middle, though the gray parts and the yellow power pipes cover up a bit of it, and there's really a bit to say about the power pipes, but we'll get to that a little bit later. One last notable seam is this one along the backpack, but I'm not so sure if there's any better way to do this. Some kits give us a backpack with a small back panel, but the shape of the Hizak backpack really doesn't lend itself to that approach very well. The Manoa is a single gray piece, and from the stickers you'll probably already guess that it doesn't move at all. But at least it's in gray and it's a reasonable color to have as the mono eye. Now let's go back to the energy pipes, which are all made in soft plastic. These of course don't like being painted, and this is a problem for parts like this section right here on the biceps that are clearly not supposed to be yellow. Then there are also these big spans of yellow between the pipes here on the forearm and the knees, both front and back, that need painting. But at least these are recessed details and they won't easily get their paint scraped off. But wait, the pipe problems don't end there. Even if you don't paint it, the pipes on the knee joints right here are designed in a very odd wrap-around way, which I guarantee that the lonely little peg right here will not be strong enough to keep the pipes in place. You can put a bit of glue on it, but the glue still will not grip the soft plastic too well. It's not that I'm picking on a kit that's now two decades old, but these are inherent flaws in the basic design of a kit, and materials aren't things a modeler can easily overcome. So keep that in mind if you're considering buying this kit. Next is something I haven't seen anyone talk about yet. So did you know that the Hizak mode was slightly upgraded at some point in the 20 years since its release? Yes, right between the legs we can see a slit that works with an action base too. And you know what? This slit did not exist when the kit was first released. 
to show you, here's a blue Hyzak, and yes, that's a thing as well. And yes, it does look kind of hideous. This is actually from the HG number 96 Ewak Zack, which contains this entire kit. And mine here is a very old one, and what do you know? The bottom does not have the slot. In fact, the studio shots on the box shows the old thigh joint, so that's an odd little update that Bandai did without ever telling anyone that they did it. Now let's have a look at some accessories, which there really aren't a lot of. First is the custom Zaku machine gun, which is kind of a silly weapon to have in UC0084, but you know, it's a Zaku, they want it to look like a Zaku. It's two pieces sandwiched together, as these things are, and the dinky little handle at the front hinges out to both sides. The magazine can be removed, and the bottom is covered up with a separate piece, which is something the origin Zakus and even the most recent shard Zaku doesn't do, which is quite a disgrace. The high Zak got this right all the way back in 2000. Now, a small issue of the gun is that the stock of the gun gets in the way of the Hyzak holding it. You'll need to wedge it slightly upwards and let it rest on top of the forearm like this. That'll keep the gun still, and the shape of the forearm seems to fit this position quite well, even though the pose itself is absolutely a little bit strange. Next is the shield, which never really made sense to me because the Hyzak already has a shoulder-mounted shield, and yet they bolt this other one on. And, you know, as if the first one wasn't good enough, but they really didn't want to admit it. Anyway, it's a simple construction, and the back part is nicely covered up. The detailing is fine, with the cutout slits done very well. The yellow cross needs painting, but that's not too surprising. And that's it. We get these two things and nothing else. Not even a solid molded beam saber, which is perhaps one of the biggest sins of this kit. The Hyzak, much like the Zaku 2, is designed around a big arsenal, as big as all this stuff right here. The omitted weapons include the beam rifle, which is shared with the Marasai. Then there's the Heat Hawk, which you currently can't get in any form in the HG line. And then there's also the beam saber. And then this rack mounted pair of missile pods. And that's the beauty of Zaku type front suits. They're made for adaptability and flexibility, and that aspect of the mobile suit's design is completely gone here without any of these weapons. The ones you see here are actually from the Zeta Gundam non grade weapon set released in 1985 for 324 yen. These still do get released from time to time, so if you do get a Hyzak, this is something you'd want to keep an eye out for, because strangely, they do mostly work with the Hyzak, so let's take a look. First off, we have the Heat Hawk, which fits directly into the fist without any problems, and as you can see, you can use it straight out of the box. The size is good, and the Hyzak looks that much more handsome with it. And it's the same story with the Beam Saber, which fits right into the hand. But the beam part is way too short, and it's in a solid color. So, for this review, I took my vintage set of weapons that I've had for many years, and I cut the blade off. I use my digital caliper to measure the peg of a clear yellow beam part, and then it's just a matter of drilling a small pilot hole into the handle first, and then drilling a bigger hole with the right diameter, and then we have a beam saber that's good enough for modern tastes. For the missile pods, they work with the Hyzak as well, sort of. The back skirt of the Hyzak has this hook that was never used for anything, but the designers clearly left the door open to make a weapon set add-on. Well, the rack of the missile pods do fit right onto the hook, but the problem is there's no support for it, so the rack and the pods would just jiggle up and down. The arms do have enough articulation to give the missile pods enough space, so loose swinging aside, the missile pods do add quite a lot of detail onto the Hyzak. Lastly, we have the beam rifle, which sadly doesn't fit the Hyzak because the handle is way too thick up top. I fixed this too by paring it down with a knife and narrowing the top of the handle. It was quick and easy to do, and then the gun fit into the trigger hand just fine. Except that the trigger finger won't actually fit into the trigger guard no matter what, but you know what, we'll call it done for now. So as you can see, the character of the Hyzak drastically changes with the loadout that you choose, and the missing weapons will limit how much you can enjoy the kit in this way. It's safe to say that most people who want a Hyzak would prefer having all these weapons over having a lower price. So come on Bandai, how about a P Bandai update? Yeah, I know it ain't happening. Now for the articulation. Let's start from the very very top, with the head dipping forward barely at all, but then looking back quite an okay amount. The head can turn a full circle with nothing getting in the way. 
The shoulders are on a fixed peg, so there's no swiveling out. But the arms do angle upwards quite a bit, like something close to 70 degrees. And this applies to the left arm as well with the spike armor, which is very good for a Zaku type kit. The arms of course do swing a full circle around with nothing obstructing them. The shield is on a ball joint and you can adjust it to any angle you like. The spike armor is on a single poly cap and a peg and you can swivel it on two axes. The biceps don't rotate, of course limited by the pipes right here. And then the rotation is instead handled by the elbow which lets you swing the forearms around in a full circle. The elbows are on a single joint and they fold up just short of 90 degrees. The fists are on a single ball joint so you can adjust the angle or rotate it. And quite a surprise here is the waist which rotates a little bit on a single peg. I mean it may seem pathetic how little bit it moves, but the HGUC number 9 goof and the much later HGUC number 32 Zaku lacked any waist rotation altogether, so the high Zack deserves a point right there. The front skirts lift up and they can't be separated. The side skirt armors hinge up a tiny little bit, but they can rotate forward and backwards quite a bit more. The back skirt is fixed and it can't move. Then the legs swing forward to an almost 90 degrees kick and they move backwards just a little bit before immediately hitting the back skirt. They sit on a ball joint so you can adjust the angles a little bit. The knees are a double joint but the bulky lower leg stops it just short of 90 degrees. The feet swing up a good bit and then backwards still quite a bit and they swivel side to side enough for most poses. Lastly, the fins on the backpack swivel along a single axis just a little bit and then the entire attachment can be turned downwards, even though this isn't really a part of the Hyzax design. So with all that said, here's the Hobby Clubhouse 3 point verdict on the HGUC Hyzax. Number 1. It's beautiful despite its age. I think the strongest thing that the Hyzax has going for it is how good it looks. The color separation is wonderful, and it has the heft and the bulk which makes the Hyzax so recognizable. And if you're a fan of the Hyzax design, you're going to enjoy how this kit looks, no questions asked. Number 2. It's short on weapons. Sadly, the loadout options are a part of the in-universe system that the Hyzax is designed around, and here we get only the rifle and that's boring. Something as simple as the Heat Hawk would have made a world of difference, but the situation is, we're stuck having to rely on the weapon set from 1985. And I don't think this kit is a likely candidate for any sort of updated release, so this is all we have. And for many, this won't be enough. Number 3. It's difficult to work on as a builder. The soft plastic on it needs painting, and the seam line on the head is going to be a pain to remove. Bandai's design has really come a long way since the year 2000, and it's not like the kit was subpar for its time but you will be reminded that this sort of juggling and jigsaw building was something we used to have to do before Bandai made things much much friendlier for us. But maybe that's exactly what you're looking for for your next project. So that's the review for the HG Hyzak, one of the first Zaku type units released for the HGUC line. The Hyzak seems to get far less love from fans compared to many of the other Zaku type units, but maybe it's managed to earn a spot today on your shelf or as your next project. Thank you so much for watching. Come check us out and hang out on social media. Links are also in the descriptions below. Or hang out here some more with one of these other videos. But before you go, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified of new videos from Hobby Clubhouse. And I'll see you next time.